Okay, we're going to go through the rest of this paper, uh, January 2021, Physics uh, International A-Level for Edexcel, Unit 1, Mechanics and Materials. In the previous video, we went through the multiple choice questions. So we'll see if we can do this in one video or whether we'll need two. Okay, so it tells you the section begins on the next page. Turn over, and there's the first question. Okay, so I've prepared the answers. I'm going to talk you through them. And I think I'll just zoom in a little bit more. Okay, right. It's, there's a uniform plank. This is the plank. Length is 4 meters. So the whole length is 4 meters. Pivoted at 90 centimeters, 0 0.90 meters from the one end where the larger person is standing. The weight of the plank is 250 newtons. So I've drawn that in. 250 newtons will act at 2 meters from the end. Therefore, it would be 1.1 meter from the pivot. Okay, a person of weight 950 stands at one end of the plank. So this is this person. Uh, a person of weight 650 newtons stands at a distance x from the pivot. So the plank is in equilibrium, as shown. Okay, they want you to add to the diagram to show all the forces acting on the plank. So what they haven't done is to say show all the forces. So we've put in the weight of the plank, we put the weights of the two people. What have we missed? Okay, so you have to remember that the conditions for equilibrium is that there are two conditions for e equilibrium. One is that the um, moments, the turning effects of the clockwise weights, in this case these two, must balance the anti-clockwise weights. So this is anti-clockwise. And these two, the smaller person and the weight of the, the plank itself, will have uh, clockwise turning effects. So the turning effects must be balanced for equilibrium conditions, but there's another condition which is even simpler, the forces downwards must add up to the forces upwards. So I've drawn an arrow at the pivot. That's where all of the force upwards, there's a reaction there. Okay, and that reaction must add up to 950 plus 650 plus 250 for it to um, be balanced in the vertical direction. So how much is 950 plus 250? That's 1,200. So the reaction should be 1,850 newtons upwards. R equals that. So that would be one where you could easily lose the marks. Okay, so you get one mark for showing all the downward forces, and you get one mark for showing the reaction correctly as 18, uh, as 1850. Okay, so I'm just going to make sure that I'm following the mark scheme. Yes, three downward arrows for the force on the people uh, and the weight of the plank, and one upward arrow to show the reaction uh, contact value for the force at the pivot. Okay, so that's important to get the two marks. It then wants you to calculate the only unknown, which is x. So this time you have to use the principle of moments. So what I said is that some of the clockwise moments must be equal to the sum of the anti-clockwise moments. Okay. Well, there are two objects clockwise, the 250 Newton weight of the plank at 1.1 meter from the pivot. So we're taking moments about the pivot, which means we don't have to worry about the reaction force because the reaction force is neither clockwise nor anti-clockwise. It's acting through the pivot. The distance to the pivot is zero. Remember, a moment is force times the perpendicular distance to the turning effect, to the pivot, in this case, P. 
All right, so then you have to add to the 250 newtons acting here, 1.1 meters. That's what it says, 1.1 meters. You add the 650 newtons for the smaller person multiplied by their distance to the pivot, which is x. So we know everything on the left-hand side apart from x, and on the right-hand side of the equation is the anti-clockwise turning effects, which is 950 newtons. The person standing at the end, they told us, is 0 0.90. I should really put 0 0.90 in there, uh, just as I should put 1.10 in there, I suppose. All right, so basically you just do the algebra and you'll see that x comes to 0.89 meters. Okay, so this question is about conditions for equilibrium. And remember, there are two conditions for equilibrium. One, the sum, the resultant forces in any two, in any direction must be zero. And the sum of the moments about any point must also be balanced. Okay or some of the moments, positive and negative, must add to zero. Okay, so that's question 11 done. The next question is question 12. Yeah. Okay, I'm just getting my papers uh, in the right order, sorry, and putting them away. Question 12 is a moving walkway, yeah? often found in airports, it says, one moving walkway carries passengers up at an incline of 30 degrees. Okay, so basically, as it's going upwards at a fixed velocity, okay, the speed of the walkway is 0.51 meters per second. I've called it U here and V there. So let's just change that to V here. So we're consistent because I've used V to show you how you work out the vertical component of that velocity. So as it's going up 0.51 meters per second, the height gained, you can work out through a height gain per second. Uh, you can use opposite over hypotenuse to work out the um, how far is this increasing its height, because that's what you need to do in the calculation. A single passenger of mass 72 kilograms, so m is 72, stands on the walkway. Um, the speed is given to you, as I mentioned. Show that the rate at which, because that means rate means per second, at which the walkway does work on the passenger is about 200 uh, watts. Okay, so work is being done against gravity, yeah, by the mechanical um, escalator or what do you want to call it, the walkway. So it's a mechanical work situation. So work is being done this time against gravity, so potential energy is gained per second. So the potential energy is mgh, and the potential energy, the power, we want, would, would be the rate of doing work would be the potential energy divided by time. That would give you the power. So we know mg, because they told us the mass is 72, g is 9.81, and delta h over t can be worked out by trigonometry, knowing that it's going at 0.51 meters per second. So the opposite would be um, sine 30 must be opposite over um, hypotenuse. So we know V. So all we want to know is what is delta H over T. Well, delta H over T will be the velocity times sine 30. Remember, sine 30 is 0.5. So you put all those numbers in, 72 times 9.81, etc., etc., and you come up to 180 watts approximately equal to the 200 and that's how you get your three marks okay so the three marks in this question are given for use of the equation for potential energy so knowing that you've equated to potential energy and putting in the correct values I should imagine uh, use of the trigonometry to calculate H so one for that or you could get it for down here and you get one mark for getting your answer as 180. It then says for part B, the walkway system has an efficiency of 78%, which is sim usually symbolized by epsilon, the Greek letter. So 78% is 0.78. Calculate the power input to the system when 15 passengers of average mass, 72 kilograms, are standing on the walkway. So efficiency is the useful power output, yeah? Uh, which is what we have uh, 
calculate it, yeah? Calculate the power input. So the power input will be the bottom of the fraction. So we want to calculate this value on the bottom. So we know this, and we know this from part um, A, okay? So we're going to use the 180. So, you know, you're going to do the total power input must be 15 times what we've calculated for one person. So you multiply it by the average weight of the people or the mass of the people, 72 kilograms, divided by the efficiency. If you change the subject of the formula around, this will be correct. So it's 15 times 180 divided by the efficiency, which is 0.18. You come up with the answer of 3.46 times 10 to the 3. And really, you can round it up because they've only given us two significant figures. So you could put it to 3,500 watts. One for use of the equation. So you put numbers in this equation. Yeah. One for calculating the useful power output. Yeah. Uh, which we've done in part B. Oh, so 15 times is the fact that you multiply by 15. So this is the useful power output. And um, one for making sure you've got the right units as well. So the answer with the units. Okay, so that's 12B. Now 13. Question 13 is about projectile motion. So you can see that projectile motion uh, is this time to do with rugby. Um, a rugby player kicks a ball. Just to make sure we're on the... camera correctly, kicks a ball off the ground at an angle 35 degrees to the horizontal, so drawn the tangent to the parabolic curve, and they've shown the maximum height at 5 meters. Okay, so the ball reaches its maximum height at 5 meters before returning to the ground. Show that the U, the initial speed of the ball, is about 17 meters, so what do we know? We know that the vertical distance is 5 meters. We know that the vertical component of U is u sine 35. Remember, if you're going away from the, the horizontal, it will be sine of the angle to the horizontal. If you're going, uh, you want to go horizontally, it would be cos. Okay? If you don't know that, you just need to go and refresh your, um, your trigonometry. I'm not going to go through the trigonometry in the physics paper. And you know that the acceleration is due to gravity and it's in, uh, against, acting against the height, so it will lose height. That's why it doesn't maintain its trajectory initially going at this angle. The angle will get less as it reaches um, the maximum height. Okay, And then you know at 5 meters the vertical velocity will be 0. So we know u, s, a and v, so you've got to use v squared equals u squared plus 2as. You put your numbers in, as uh, I've shown on the right hand side, and the answer comes out to 17.3 which is approximately equal to 17 meters per second. So what I'll show you is if you can get into the habit when you're doing practice questions of showing how you get the answers, you, um, where you get the information from, it will make your answers really easy for the examiner. And remember, the examiner is wanting to get the papers marked as soon as possible because he gets paid by the paper. So he won't want to read through messy answers. So that's 13 uh, a, 13b then comes to uh, the second part of the question. So now we're going to look at the horizontal motion. After traveling a horizontal distance of 22 meters, the ball reaches the goal. Okay, so that's 22 meters from the kick. So telling us the horizontal distance is 22 meters. To score, in rugby, the ball must be more than three meters above the ground, so it goes over this bar. Okay, so we want to work out whether the initial speed of approximately 17.0 meters per second is sufficient to score. Now we actually calculate it as 17.3, but we will use 17.0 because it's telling us that the initial speed of 17.0. So we know that u is 17.0. And we know the horizontal component of that is u cos 35, as I explained to you in the previous question. Okay, So we know the horizontal distance. We know the initial velocity. We know the initial velocity horizontally. We want to work out time now. 
as we know, in these questions, we're assuming no air resistance. So if there's no air resistance, it's going to keep its horizontal velocity will remain constant. Okay, so uh, u horizontal is thirteen point nine, so this would become thirteen point nine. So you get one mark for calculating that time to reach the goal. Time is distance over speed. So once you do that, divide your twenty two, which is given to you by the thirteen point nine, which you just worked out, and it will take one point five eight seconds to reach the goal. Okay. So the second part is at 1.58 seconds vertically, what will be the distance um, vertical? Okay, so if it's going to give you an answer uh, when we calculate it above 3 meters, it means it will go over the bar. If the answer is less than 3 meters, it will not go over the bar and therefore it will not be a goal. Okay, so this, it won't count. So we know the time we want to use is 1.58 from here, we go back to our vertical velocity is 17.0. So we're using the value that they told us here rather than the value we calculated, which was 17.3. So 17.0 times sine 35 this time. A again is minus 9.81. Okay. Um, A is minus 9.81. And uh, we want to work out the height vertically, so displacement vertically at this time. Okay, so we know S, U, A, and T, so we're going to use S equals U, T plus half A, T squared. In this case, um, U is 17 times sine 35, so it comes out, multiply that by the T, and then you've got the second bit where the acceleration, half the acceleration times T squared will give you the answer of 3.16 meters. What does that tell us? 3.16 meters is um, greater than the value, the height of the goal. Yeah, so since it's greater, it will, the initial speed of the kit is sufficient to score. So that's what I've put in at the bottom. I zoomed out too far. Apologies, let's zoom back in. So. It's nice and big on the video. Okay, so that's you you do need to explain once you've done the calculation for the final mark, your conclusion, yeah? Your, your deduction. So the deduce, you have now deduced it, and you need to communicate that you know that you've answered the question. Okay? It's not just math where you just put answers on a page. All right, so that's question 13. Question 14, as you can see in the photo I've just shown you, is projectile pumping water. So this is a fire boat. So what do they want us to do? So this is question 14. Question 14 is about momentum. The photograph shows a fire boat used to put out fires on ships at sea. A pump fixed to the boat. So uh, it has a pump on it. The pump, it pumps water from the sea, so they use seawater. The seawater is projected at high speed out of a pipe connected to the pump. Okay, so that you can see that the water is being sprayed at different heights. So presumably you can alter the angle that you fire the um, water at. The mass of seawater pumped each second, so that's mass per second, is 300 kilograms. Okay, the pipe has a diameter of 10 centimeters. Remember, centimeters is 10 to the minus 2. Density of seawater is given. Water is normal, water is 1000 kilograms per meter cubed, and density of seawater is slightly greater. So, you need to use a density equation. So, I've put it down there for you. So, by when you're reading these questions, you can automatically start thinking by writing down whatever you think you're going to need to use before you read the active part of the question. They want you to show that the speed at which seawater is projected from the pipe is about 37 meters per second. That's what we've got to show, yeah? Is about 37 meters per second, okay. So I've drawn, uh, I'm saying the volume per second 
is the mass per second divided by the density. Okay, so why do I want that? Because a volume per second is shooting out, and the cross sectional area we can work out from the diameter as being pi d squared of over 4, or the area is pi d squared of 4, or the area is pi r squared. Okay, once you know the volume and the area, yeah, the volume per second's area is going to be area times the speed, the area times the speed is going to be um, the volume per second. So volume per second is area times the speed that is projected out of. So can we work out area? Yes. Do we know the volume per second? Yes. So I've calculated the volume per second. I think I'd get a mark for that. You can either use pi r squared or pi d squared over 4. They will give you the same answer. So if we're getting the answer of the area, we'll give you one mark. And uh, I'm trying to see where you get the other marks from. So one is for this, one is for working out the area, and one is for working out that the speed, once you do this equation, this is meters cubed per second, this is meters squared, so this must be meters per second. We want V, V is volume per second divided by area, 0.291, that's one divided by the area, gives us 37. 0.1 meters per second. Ah, oh, okay, they've given you a mark also for using density is mass over volume. So you get one mark for that and getting one for the answer. So quite generous, really. So I'm just making sure you can see the final answer on this question. Okay, part A1. Okay, so we've got, the question continues. This is a multi-part question. 14a part 2, the top of the page. They want you to determine the rate at which the momentum of the seawater is changed. Well, the rate of change of momentum is force. Um, so that's Newton's second law. By the pump, you may assume that the seawater is initially stationary. Okay, so we know uh, rate of change of momentum would be mv minus mu over t. Yeah. So I'm saying I'm going straight into force. They call it rate of change of momentum. So that's to me is just force. You may assume the seawater is stationary, so u is 0, mv minus mu over t. So we just want to know mv over t. Now remember, m over t was 300 kilograms per second. So this is the 300. And therefore, multiply by velocity, you'll get the force. Do you agree with that? So we know the velocity was 37. So all you've got to do is multiply the 300 by um, the velocity that you calculated, and it comes out to 1.11 times 10 to the 4 kilograms meters per second divided by seconds. Well, that's a newton, or you could put it as kilograms meters seconds to the minus 2. Okay, that shows that it's force, mass times acceleration. Okay, so remember this is Newton's second law. That's all it is. Okay, the next part of the question. Projecting water from the pipe causes a force to be exerted on the pump. Yeah, so obviously if the pipe is pushing the water out, there must be an equal and opposite reaction um, on the pump from the water. So the pump pushes the water out, the water must push the pump backwards. Explain the direction of the force on the pump. So if the pump applies this force forwards on the water, the water applies an opposite force backwards on the pump. So the key word is actually backwards. I shouldn't put it in brackets because they want to explain the direction. How do you explain it? The answer is Newton's third law. So it must be in the opposite direction. Okay, that is 14b. Um, so it's really just showing that you know it's Newton's second, third law. So the first bit was Newton's second law and so on. The next bit, it's part C, is a three mark question. So Newton's third law and that will give me the marks backwards and Newton's third law. So the initially the pump is turned off. Okay. So initially so we're assuming that when the pump's turned off, the fire boat moves through the water at constant speed. So this is now Newton's first law at constant speed because we've got a balance for situation, balance forces. The boat's engines provide a constant forward force. So you've got the forward force of the engine force and then you've got the drag 
of going through the water and the drag and the forward force must be balanced for Newton's first law. Okay, when the pump is turned on, the water is projected forwards. Okay, so as we just said in the part B, that's going to produce a backward force on the boat because the boat is attached to the pump. So the fireboat slows to a lower constant speed. Okay, so now we've got an unbalanced force situation. And it's against the motion. That's why it slows down. So you've got to explain why the boat has now uh, now has a lower constant speed. So why does it get to a new lower constant speed? Well, first it decelerates and then it goes to a lower constant speed. So it goes back to a balanced situation. So when is it unbalanced? The unbalanced is when you're putting the pump on and then it will rebalance itself by the drag adjusting. So how do we put it into words? Your answer should refer to all the horizontal forces on the boat. Well, what are the horizontal forces on the boat? Okay, you've got uh, the force, engine force, you've got the drag force. Initially, with the pump off, the thrust of the engine or forward force of the engine must equal the drag. That's one mark. Balance ho horizontal forces. Okay, Newton's first law. I'm not asking you to uh, refer to Newton's first law or anything. So as long as you have got um, the drag force is equal to the forward force initially with the pump off, you get one mark. When the pump is switched on, there is an additional force applied against the motion of the boat on the pump, as explained in part B here, yeah? which means that the backwards force is now greater while you put switching on the pump than the forward for than the thrust forwards. So the boat will slow down and the uh, unbalanced, as you have unbalanced forces horizontally. So that's the second bit, which we've already discussed. And finally, for the third bit, as it slows down, the drag force, force will decrease because the drag force is basically proportional to the speed. So as it slows down, the drag force will decrease until the forces horizontally, that's meant to say horizontally, I ran out of space, are balanced again. Okay, so that's how you get the three phases of the situation. So just need to make sure you can see the end of that third mark. Okay, that's how you get the 11 marks in this question. Okay, so that's question 14. And the next question, 15, is also about forces. And this time they want you to focus on energy rather than answering in forces. But let's read the question together and see. This is, has an asterisk on it, and um, it, on the next page you'll see it's a six mark question. In a bungee jump, the bungee jumper falls from the high platform while attached to an elastic cord. Now remember, there's no point in being attached to the elastic cord, the cord must also be attached to the platform. So it's just common sense, but they are spelling it out for you. The cord slows the, uh, the, cord slows the bungee jumper down eventually, yeah? so that he comes to rest before hitting the ground. So presuming the ground is somewhere here, not this dotted line. Okay. So this is actually quite similar to skydiving, except the deceleration is due to the cord and the elasticity of the cord. So let me just push it back up so you can see that he hasn't reached the ground yet. So there's three stages they want to look at as shown in the diagram. So this is just a scenario. The cord slows the bungee jumper so that it comes red before it hits the ground. The fall can be divided into three stages. Stage one, the jumper is in free fall. So stage one is here. The cord is still not really doing anything because it's still not being stretched. So in stage one, the cord is not stretched. So it's in free fall. So acceleration is equal to gravity. So it's a bit like a skydiver jumping out of a plane. The uh, initially, the acceleration is a full value of gravity. Okay, so we're ignoring air resistance uh, again. Stage two, you can see it's starting to, the, the, the length of the cord is now starting to be the beginning. This is where it starts to be stretched. Okay, so stretching starts here. At, the, at this dotted line. Okay. 
So the cord is stretching in stage two, yeah, until the acceleration reaches zero. So over here, the acceleration will be equal to zero, okay? So the cord has managed to, the uh, tension in the cord, if you like, increases after st in stage two. And at this stage, the tension must be equal to the weight, yeah? So they're not asking you to do that, but that must be, if acceleration is zero, you must have a balanced force situation for the acceleration to be zero. So at the end of stage two. Stage three, the cord continues to stretch. Now, what does that mean? It means the tension must be greater than the mg. From here to here, the tension goes from being equal to being greater than, that until the jumper is momentarily at rest. Okay, so at this point, the velocity will be equal to zero. So the acceleration will actually become negative, yeah? Uh, from there to there, the acceleration will go to negative. Now, I'm just explaining to you what's happening from a physics point of view. We have to see what the question is going to ask, okay? Because you may be surprised. So the question is now asking, explain in terms of work done, sorry, Adjusting my camera again. Explained in terms of work done how the kinetic energy of the jumper changes during the three stages of the fall. Now remember stage one is at free fall. So the kinetic energy is increasing at the rate of uh, acceleration due to gravity. So kinetic energy increases one mark. But they want you to explain it in terms of work done. Kinetic energy and work done. As work done is done by the gravitational force. Okay. So the work is being done by the gravitational force. So you've got basically gravitational potential energy all going into kinetic energy, ignoring air resistance, which is uh, not uh, expected in this question. Kinetic energy in stage two, the kinetic energy still increases because he's still speeding up, but, the, uh, but at a reduced rate compared to stage one, because here it was falling at free fall rate. So A was G, now A will be less than G but it will not be, it will still be positive. So, because some work is done on the cord, I put some as a clarification, because some work is done on the cord as, the, as it stretches, okay? Some work is done on the cord as the cord stretches. So you have to do work to stretch the cord. Um, as work is still being done by the gravitational force. So the gravitational force is still coming in, this time the gravitational potential energy goes to the kinetic energy and work done to st on the cord to stretch it, okay? In stage three, the kinetic energy decreases eventually to zero, okay? So they want you to explain the kinetic energy. So here the kinetic energy still increases, but at a reduced rate, so you need to put that. Why? Because some work is now being done there. That's your fourth mark. This is how I would mark it if, it if I was a chief examiner. And I think if you do this, you'll get it. The kinetic energy starts decreasing at stage three. Why? Because more work is done on the cord because there's a larger force times the extension. So the cord is pulling back and the cord is pulling you uh, in the opposite direction to your motion. In other words, all the work done by the gravitational force um, plus some work being done the, by the, at the expense of the kinetic energy goes into stretching the cord. So I think this final mark is the difficult one to make sure you get. And so you will get five marks quite easily, I think, in this. It's the clarity of your final point, which you need to make sure the examiner is satisfied with. So this is question 15. I will just look at it for you. Uh, on the mark scheme to see if there's any clarification we need to make. Um, so in stage three, it, they've written exactly the following. In stage three, the kinetic energy is decreasing, so we've got that. And the clarification, they've given you an or. Because work is done on the cord at a greater rate than the gravitational force um, does work on the jumper. So most of the work is now gone to, do, to be um, against the cord. He comes to rest, or he says, you can write the following, or he comes to rest because the total work done by the gravitational forces is equal to the work done stretching the bungee. So this is a qualitative answer, and a lot of students 
we're good at maths, find these questions difficult to verbalize, especially if English is not your first language. So you need to get used to answering these six markers. Uh, I've got a student who um, has very little English, but his maths is great. So he learns all the key terms to make sure that he's got the answers in preparation. He does every single exam paper twice to make sure he understands the language of physics. Okay, so that is question 15. And now we're going to go into question 16 straight away. Um, I've zoomed in a bit more. Hopefully it will work. Hopefully I won't forget to move the camera in position. So question 16. Again, it's about materials. So the bungee cord was about materials. We looked at energy. Um, now we're going to look at a steadily increasing tensile force applied to a sample of titanium alloy. They've got a stress against strain graph. The sample had an original length L0 of 40.0 centimeters and a diameter of 5.05 um, millimeters. So remember, this is centimeters and this is millimeters. Hopefully, when I did my answers, I didn't forget that. Okay, so state a suitable measuring instrument to measure the diameter of the sample. Well, you can see it's given to 0 0.05 accuracy millimeter. So you would not be able to use vernier calipers. Vernier calipers have a resolution of 0.1 millimeter. They wouldn't be able to give you this accurately. But now they make digital calipers. So digital calipers have a resolution of 0 0.01 millimeter, the same as a micrometer. Okay, so um, either of those will give you the resolution that you need to get the data as shown. Okay, so now let's look at the graph. The graph is showing you a stress against strain for the sample. So stress is in megapascals, and strain is just a dim is dimensionless, has no units. So strain strain is just given as a fraction. Okay, so as you can see, I've drawn a tangent for the initial part of the graph where it's uh, directly proportional. Because when you have stress and strain, you, know, you can guess what they're going to ask you. It's going to ask you about what is the Young's modulus. So I'm going to leave the, the graph for us to look at. You'll see I've got other numbers on there. I've shown my gradient very clearly of how much the increase where I've drawn my thing. So I've shown I've done that at 1200 megapascals and that nicely, so they've been kind, if you draw on the tangent accurately, comes to 0 0.01, so delta y is 1200, yeah, uh, times 10 to 6 for mega, and this is 0 0.01, so it's a very nice calculation. So once you've got that, they want you to determine, so I'll try and show, determine the Young's modulus of the sample. So there's my gradient on my graph. Okay, so I'm using the gradient in my graph. Gradient was 1200 times 10 to the 6 pascals divided by 0 0.01. So that's where it's come from. The 12 times 10 to the 6 divided by 0 0.01. It gives you an answer, if you do it correctly, of 1.20 times 10 to the 11. Don't forget the units. So one for showing the gradient on the graph. Always use a tangent method. Okay and make the tangent uh, large. Don't just do it a small part of the tangent. It reduces your percentage uncertainty if there's any misreading of the scale. Okay, then it says the sample broke at point B. So once again, we need to look at the graph. Point B on the graph is here. Okay, it broke. So at this point, what was the stress? And that breaking stress is normally a constant for a material given material here yeah. so it depends obviously if there has any uh, micro uh, defects in it but usually a certain material will break at a given stress okay um, I think there may have been question on that in the multiple choice so it's a constant for a given material so I've got the 1280 here as the breaking stress um, do we need anything else Forget about the other numbers on there. That comes for a later question, which I'll show you in a minute. The sample broke at B. Determine the force required to break the sample. Well, force is stress times area because stress is force over area. So they just want you to know that you're using the correct equation. So when we're doing that, 
um, breaking stress read from the graph. So you get one mark for showing that you read this from the graph. Yeah. So that's 1280. Get one mark for that. You then have to use a equals 4 uh, pi r squared or pi d squared over 4, whichever way you do it. Uh, the area calculated will be 2.00 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared. And um, uh, so you've got to make sure you've put it, the milli it was millimeters, wasn't it? So the 10 to the minus 3 in there. So once you've got the area and you've got the reading from the graph, you multiply them together and you'll get your four marks. So one for the reading from the graph, one for the area, one for multiplying the stress times the area, so you know which equation you're using, and one for the final answer, which you can round up to uh, two significant figures. Okay, so there's your four marks. So we haven't finished with this graph. They're now asking you another thing about the graph. So... The next bit is about the area under the graph. Now, did I show you all my page? Yes, you could see it all. All right, so part three. The graph below is just a, a normal stress strain graph. It's not for, it's just a theoretical graph. The graph below shows a linear section of the stress strain graph for the sample. Okay, so it's meant to be for the sample. So the area underneath, remember, is a triangle. It's half base times height. So show that the area under this graph represents the work done per unit volume in stretching the sample. Okay, well, it's basically uh, the area under the graph is stress time strain. So it's uh, strain is extension over length and stress is force over area. But it's half of that because it's an area of a triangle. It's not the maximum force. So the F would be the maximum force. So it's the average force. So that will be... Uh, F divided by 2. So when you, when you said you got that, F times X, if you multiply the top, is the same as work done. So that would be joules. Yeah? And then the A times the orig original length, the cross-sectional area times the length, is the volume. So this is in meters cubed. Yeah? So they're saying, show that it's work done per um, unit volume. So th this is volume, and this is work done. So you can show the top is in joules and the bottom is in meters cubed. I think this way of showing it will get you the three marks. Okay, so what does it say? Use of area under the graph. Yeah, so we've got that area under the graph as being half stress times strain. Substitution of uh, F uh, in the equation. So basically this substitution and this. So both these substituted for what strain and stress are. And then one mark, it says, for showing AX is equal, or AL naught, I called it, is equal to volume, um, as well as doing that. So this final bit together, this final bit together here, is worth one, the third mark. Okay? All right, so what are we doing next? It says, the area under any stress-strain graph represents work done per unit volume. So we've shown it there, they're just saying that's a fact. Yeah, which is often what I explain it, that um, stress in itself, because strain doesn't actually have uh, any units. Stress in itself is equivalent to how much energy per unit volume you've got in the sample. When you put too much energy in a sample, it gets to breaking point eventually. Estimate the work done, or the amount of work required to break the titanium alloy. So if we know it's the area under the graph, we have to estimate the area under the graph they've given us. So again, looking at the graph, that's what I've done. I've worked out how many big squares, and by big squares I mean one this size, there are. So I've estimated that. So here's four, for example, four big squares, four, 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 three. And I estimated this bit up to here to be approximately three and this bit here to be approximately three, and then added up all the little bits here. So this bit goes a little bit beyond there. So I've counted that as one square, and I've counted how many little squares there are, and I've done the same for there, and this triangle, roughly triangle, curved triangle shape there. So I've added that all together, and I estimate that is about 29 complete 
large square, squares and all the little bits add up to about the extra bits are about two so I think 31 number of complete large squares and I've defined it as 200 megapascals by 0 0.01 so I'm talking about 200 megapascals by 0 0.01 so once we know that we know the quantities we've got to use to be able to calculate the work done or the energy stored under the graph up to the breaking point to break means right up to point B so 31 of these uh, values the volume um, you've got to work out because you want to do it per volume so this is how much energy there is per, per big square and this is the volume multi this is the energy per unit volume yeah multiply by the volume the volume comes out to 8 times 10 to the minus 6 meters cubed that's multiplying the original length given which is 0 0.40 I'll show you where that comes from in the question 0 0.40 is given to you the original length so you hadn't had to use that before and the cross-sectional area we worked out before I think um, so you multiply them together you get the volume so it's approximately 4.96 times 10 to the 2 joules but this is an approximate so you can write it up and multiply that by the uh, volume it will give you 500 joules or thereabouts okay an annoying question as far as I'm concerned I don't like doing these little fiddly questions because it takes quite a long time to make sure you get it right. Okay? And that's how you should lay out or you could lay out your question. Okay? So that's how you do an estimate of these questions. Okay? That's question 16 complete. The next page is question 17. Okay, so question 17 is about forces in equilibrium. Okay, um, I'm sure you read the question. I'm just going to take a sip of water before we come to this. So it says, the mass is held in equilibrium by, spring, by strings. So you've got a string here, a string here, and a string here. Actually, this was an experiment carried out. I know because I've been around for a while. This experiment was actually carried out as a practical exam in 1997, 1998. So they used to have to do it actually under exam conditions. So attach two clamp stands. So you've got tension here, you've got tension there. This one you can measure with a force meter. This one they're going to give you. The force in the horizontal string P is P, the angle made by the upper string to the horizontal, this force, and that is theta. The force meter here, Newton meter, is using Hooke's law. So stretching a spring, and by the amount of extension of the spring inside the meter, it allows the stretching force to be read from its scale. So it's being calibrated into Newtons. That's how Newton meters work. When the force applied to stretch the spring is 15 Newtons, the extension is 8 centimeters. Okay. Show that the stiffness inside of the spring inside the force meter is about two newtons per centimeter. So I was going to change the, this to uh, meters, then I realized they want you to do it per centimeter. So you don't need to, that's why I have this uh, blob in there. You just ignore that, that's eight uh, centimeters. So we're doing newtons divided by centimeters. And if you do the force divided by centimeters, you'll come out to uh, 1.875, um, which is approximately equal to two centimeters so you get one for putting numbers in and one for the answer with the units so that's question 17 first part and then the second part it says when m in the diagram is equal to 0.55 kilograms so remember m was the weight hanging down the value of p is 8.5 newtons okay and uh, calculate the value of theta and the extension of the spring. So they want you to calculate the value of theta and the extension of the spring. Okay, so that's, I've called it x. They've called it delta x, but this doesn't really matter. So this is the force diagram. The weight is pulling down, the P is pulling to the side, and the F, it changes according to uh, how much weight you've put on. So this is the situation diagram. Okay, so we know W, we know P, we don't know F because it's changed, yeah? It's not what we calculated in part A. So this is a situation diagram. The forces are known. So we draw, they want us to draw, uh, well, I would draw a force diagram always to show what's going on. So we know the weight is exactly this. We know this is exactly that. 
So you can change the force diagram into a vector diagram. Once you've got a vector diagram, you can say F is that way. W could be drawn this side or this side. And I've drawn it so the angle here is theta, where you can do it the other way. So we know W and we know P. This is also P. Okay, so we know opposite over adjacent, tan theta will be W over P. So you can work out what it is. So you can get the theta straight away using trigonometry with a vector diagram 32.4. You can then use that angle. I decided to resolve, the, the examiners use Pythagoras. I resolved um, horizontally. So F cos F, in this one it's easier to see, F, the component of F horizontally would be F cos theta. It would be 32.4 is what we calculated. So F cos 32.4, F cos theta must equal P. Okay? So if F cos theta equals P, and remember F is from Kx, uh, then Kx must be equal to P, which is 8.5, divided by cos theta. Yeah? And K is from the part what A we use, can we use 1.88, that's what they're recommending in the mark scheme. So you then do all the algebra, and it comes out again in centimeters, because we have we had our stiffness per centimeter. So 32.4 and 5.37 centimeters are the answers. So this is about resolving. Um, you could do it by Pythagoras as well. So if you look at the mark scheme, you'll see they've used Pythagoras. Okay. The next question and the last question is 18. So, uh, sorry about this long video, but it's, it will save time in the long run. So, 18. A spherical polystyrene bead, well, polystyrene is very light, is immersed in oil. So, you put the bead, presumably you've got the bead already in the, in the jar or whatever you're using. Um, the bead has a diameter of 4.00 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. That means... The radius is 2 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. The bead is released. Yeah, well, obviously, when you pour the oil in, the bead is very light, so it will move upwards through the oil, and it says eventually it will reach constant velocity. Uh, so th there are balanced forces. If they're balanced forces, they want you to complete the free body force diagram. Yeah to show all the forces acting on the object. Because it's moving upwards, the drag will be against um, uh, the motion and the weights. The drag and the weight together must equal the upthrust. So that's the balance forces you've got, which you will need later. But you get a mark for the drag and the weight balancing the upthrust. Then part B says show that the upthrust uh, is about 3.1 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons. Okay, they're giving you a density of oil. Now, you remember that the upthrust is equal to the weight of fluid displaced, so you need the volume. The volume can be calculated, so you get one mark for calculating the volume. Then the weight is the volume times the density to get the mass, multiplied by g to make it into newtons. Okay, So you're basically putting this number, which is all of that, times the density times gravity, and it comes up with 3.06 times 10 to the minus 4, which is about... 3.1 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons. Okay, there's your three marks. The next part of the question says Stokes' law. Stokes' law allows the viscous drag on the sphere, so it shows how the uh, Stokes' law shows how the viscous drag on the sphere is related to its velocity through a fluid. Stokes' law is only valid, however, if the bead is moving sufficiently slowly through the oil. State the reason for this condition. The flow must be laminar for Stokes' law to be valid. So it is, if it, it is so at slow speeds, I've written, for spherical objects. So as long as you've got the word laminar in there or not turbulent, you'll get the mark. Now, the second part of the, the next part of the question is actually going to ask you to see whether it's going slowly enough as it's moving up through the oil. Okay, and we come to the final page of this exam. Um, so it says, for Stokes' law again to be valid, 
the speed of the bead through the oil must be less than VR as defined by this equation. 10 times the viscosity of oil, where eta is given to you as 4.9 times 10 to the minus 2 pascal seconds, and the divided by density of oil, which we've got from the previous part of the question, times the diameter of the bead, which they've given us in the question before. So if you put all those numbers in, yeah, the density and the diameter of the bead, the viscosity, yeah, so that's this value. You put all the numbers in, you do the number crunching, it says uh, the maximum speed must be 0.132, okay? It must, so that should be the maximum speed. So we know what the maximum speed should be, so now what do we have to do? We have to deduce whether Stokes' law can be applied to this situation, to this speed moving up through the oil. Well, they've given us all this, plus they've given us W, yeah, um, as being the weight of the polystyrene bead, which we haven't had to use before. But we know from the balance situation in part A that D is equal to U minus W. We're interested in, uh, we know U from before was calculated from part B. We know W from here, so we can work out the difference between D and W. We also know D, according to Stokes' law, on the equations that they've given, is 6 pi R eta V. Okay, So you equate those two values. You do the difference between the upthrust and the thing, and you get this value for one mark. Okay, As long as you know that you're using your balance force situation, you get one mark. One mark for calculating it. And then you can then equate, make V the subject of the formula, so it'll be U minus W divided by everything else on this side. Put the numbers in, it comes out to 0.16 meters per second. Yeah, so it's one, two, it's the third one. And then you're saying the calculated value, yeah, the calculated value of this is less than VR, which we calculated up there. Therefore, the conclusion must be that Stoke law is not valid at the calculated speed. Okay, so that, that presumably that means there must be some turbulence created. Okay. Okay. Well, that leads us to the final part. That's at the end of the final question. I hope you found that useful. Um, so that's all the answers to the January twenty twenty one paper. If you found it useful, please share it with your friends doing these papers as well because I want to show students how they should be practicing writing out their answers. You shouldn't just throw your answers on the page. You need to really improve your exam technique. So that's how you get the, the greatest number of marks. It's about clarity of communication. So please share it, like it, and if you want to know when I do the next video, subscribe to the channel and press that bell notification so we get enough subscribers to make it worthwhile for me to make additional videos. Okay, well, thank you very much for watching, and that's all for this time. Thank you, and bye.